my hopes in Matthew this time through was, you know, to kind of do it a little bit more expediently. And uh, it's so hard. There's so much good stuff in the Gospels. And there's some hard things that Jesus says. And plus, the chapters are just really long. It's 50, 50 chapters, or excuse me, verses in Matthew 12. So I don't know. I have no idea how far we'll make it today. I don't really have a closing idea. <laughs> So we might just stay here till the snow melts, and hopefully that works for y'all. So, oh, and Patty brought some some treats out there. Thank you. So, um, yeah, I won't go too long. When your stomach starts to growl, uh, just throw a white flag. And... <laughs> okay. Uh, anyway, so looking forward to those. So we are in Matthew chapter twelve, Matthew twelve, uh, picking up in verse twenty two. Uh, this Sunday, love that uh, Jesus sent forth justice to victory, and in his name the Gentiles will trust. I just love verse 20 and 21. Uh, that was neat. I, you know, it's one of those verses that I'm sure there's just so much more uh, to be able to understand as we grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord. Uh, but he sent forth victory, and that victory when he just had his arms out, you know, and just said, Te Telestai. The victory, it is finished. That victory he sent forth so that the Gentiles could trust in his name. Uh, And that is us. That is the church, right? We are his peculiar people called out of this world to praise him who brought us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. And in so doing, he is always working something. God is never at ease, okay? He's always at ease, but he's never at ease, right? He's, He's... He knows who makes it. He knows who doesn't. And he's working from probably even before your conception on your grandparents, whoever. And he's preparing opportunities for those who are predestined. um, Wait. uh, For those whom he knows, he predestines to be conformed into the glory of his son. So he knows if you're sitting here today and you're born again, you can't say, well, you know, I'm a good person or whatever it is. He foreknew before the foundations of the earth that you would be one of his. And so he arranged the proper difficulties, the proper blessings, the proper challenges in your life. Now, I do not believe in the unelect. Okay, I believe that God puts forth a white stone to all to say, I, I accept this, this new name. I accept this because 1 John to, to that Jesus Christ is the propitiation for our sins, and not for our sins alone, but for the sins of the whole world. And the Bible tells us that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, to the knowledge of him. For God so loved the world. Now, those who are, uh, they believe in the unelect, I believe we're all elect, and we have the free will to accept, to receive. After all, we are created in the image and the likeness of God, He does not create us in his image and likeness to condemn us eternally without our choice in the matter, okay? Without a choice, it's not love. So God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son to the elect, they would say, (laughs) that whosoever shall believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life. The gift, the graciousness, the love of God is, is so good, and he desires for us to be saved He desires for all men to be saved, but because he knows the end of all things, those who have a hardened heart against God, and it would not matter that if Jonah came out and walked up to these Pharisees and said, hey, it's me, Jonah. (laughs) Do you recognize me? Smell me. I smell like the inside of a big great fish. And they're like, hmm, that is a very good sign, but yet we will not believe, right? So, (sighs) What we see as blessings, looking back on our life, because it was something that God used to bring us to the point of utter brokenness, they see as curses that God hates them. And why should I love a God who allows bad things to happen to me, for I am such a great person, right? So you can see there's going to always be a little bit of pride wrapped up in the unrepentant. The unrepentant heart, there's always pride there. The heart is deceitfully wicked above all else. Who can know it? And then, of course, we know that this word of this, this, uh, the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, and it is able to discern both the thoughts and the intents of the heart, discerning 
the difference between soul and spirit, right? The flesh and the spirit. And so God's word is, our heart isn't. And so the difference, when trials come and we are walking in the spirit, we can say, it is well with my soul. When trials came before you were a Christian, you wondered why these things were happening to you. If you are honest, you can look at your life and go, well, I guess I did make that decision um, to do that thing. But sometimes bad things are forced upon people. And we have to say, why did this happen to me? And the reason that it happened to you is so that through your humility and repentance, and your humility is not a saving grace. Humility is a realization of how great God is. Through your humility and repentance, that God could receive glory from your life, okay? So when bad things happen to good people, when good things happen to bad people, God is trying to get some people saved and other people he just knows. And in this narrative today, those other people are called Pharisees, scribes. Now, some of them got saved. Remember, Nicodemus, Nick came to him at night, John 3, 16. He was the teacher of the law, and yet he was one that came and got Jesus' body and anointed it with um, a whole lot of stuff and laid it in Nicodemus' tomb, right? Right, not Nicodemus, Joseph of Arimathea. We were having a discussion about that last week. Nobody could remember, so just two weeks ago, whenever that was. But Nick was a Pharisee. He came. He was prideful in his religion, but he had a heart towards God, and God even reached him. And so God is trying to reach the people again. Matthew chapter 12, we end up in verse 22. We've seen miracle after miracle. Uh, you know, there's 10 or so very specific miracles that Jesus did that, that Matthew records uh, extensively. But then this one, there's just, there was a, a such a one. And this is one of those breaking points. We, we saw that after the miracles happened, that the religious leaders wanted to condemn Jesus. And so he opens it up in Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Come to me. All you who are weary and heavy laden. He came to the Jew first. He came for the Jews. They rejected him. So then he opens up his call to all who are weary and heavy laden, and you will find rest, right? Fantastic. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So that's when this battle kind of begins with the religious leaders. They're wanting to condemn the innocent, the guiltless, the, the, the disciples as they're going through a grain field. Again, he reminds them, have you not read the scriptures? Have you not read the scriptures? I told you in chapter 9. Go back to chapter 9, you Pharisees, <laughs> and read. I said, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. They had failed to do that. They had elevated the law and the Sabbath and the temple above the love of God and this promise of God's coming Messiah. So it says in chapter 12, verse 22, then one was brought to him who was demon-possessed, blind, and mute. You know, uh, what, what a, uh, quite a bit of stuff. Nothing going out of this guy, nothing coming into this guy. You know, he's not seeing, he's not able to speak, and he is demon-possessed, and then it just says, and he healed him so that the blind man, blind and mute both spoke and saw. So Matthew just kind of lays this out there. He doesn't say anything about the demon being removed, but in verse 28, it gets, it's clarified, Jesus removed the demon, and the demon must have been very part and parcel of why this man was blind and mute, okay? Demon possession, demon obsession, uh, whatever it may be, this man's malady was because of a demonic activity in his life. Verse 23, and all the multitudes were amazed and said, could this be the son of David? Now, when the Pharisees heard it, they said, this fellow casts out demons, does not cast out demons except by the Lord of the flies, Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. All right, so we see a difference here. Those who are the multitudes, the unnamed masses just following after Jesus, they're amazed and they say, could this be the son of David? Now, Jesus calls himself the son of David. 
uh, a few times. The, the scriptures, Matthew uh, chapter 1, verse 1, says, Jesus, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Okay, And Matthew, of course, is trying to prove to non-believers and Jews that Jesus is the promised Messiah. He's the son of Abraham because there was a promise made to Abraham. Isaac, you shall call his name Isaac, which means laughter, and in its wonderful picture, the Holy Spirit tells us who he is in advance and um, what his name should be, and that he's this son to this couple who Abraham's as good as dead, and Sarah's womb was dead, and, and they were there like, how could this be? We're very old and, and crusty, and God says, don't worry about it, and so he's a foreshadow of Jesus. Uh, the name is prophesied, the, name, or the, ver- the birth, like a virgin birth, a womb that was already dead. And so he's the son of Abraham, and he's the son of David. And the people here say, could this be the son of David? Now, um, the blind men in chapter 9, when they were healed, the two blind men who were outside of the city, they said, son of David, have, have mercy on us. And so they recognized him as son of David. So some are recognizing Jesus as this promised offspring and seed of David who would be God's anointed or Messiah, the Christ. And uh, so they're saying, I think that he's done so many things. And they're like, maybe he's the Messiah. Let's see. Let's see if he throws Rome off, you know. But, but he, he, he'd already quoted from Isaiah. He will send forth justice to victory. It was the cross that was the victory that Jesus came for. He didn't come to condemn men at this time, but he came to save them. So now the people, the multitudes are going, he's possibly the Messiah. Verse 24, now when the Pharisees heard it, they said, this fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. So they're blaming, they're they're accrediting Jesus' power to cast out demons on Satan himself. So that's kind of an insult. (laughs) It's kind of like the evolutionary theory, you know. Um, In the olden days, they would say, well, it wasn't Yahweh that created the world. It was, you know, some other God, and they would would give the credit somewhere else. And so at least it's a a super-duper being of some sort. But today, evolution just says, well, random chance and death brought about, you know, humanity and, and life. And it's just, it's pretty crazy. So they're blaming Jesus' power on the Lord of the flies, okay, the Lord of dung. That's pretty, pretty low. It's a great description of Satan um, and uh, the ruler of the demons, who Satan is. Now, remember this, that uh, demonic power to this person in, in, in verse 22, it changed his life. It made him mute. It made him blind. But to the Christian, it's like having flies an- annoy you right? Because there's no weapon formed against you that prosper. And greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. We resist the devil and he will flee from us. We draw near to God and he will draw near to us, right? We cleanse our hands, purify our hearts and draw near to God. And then the, the temptings, the tryings of the demons, it's kind of like flies. That's a really annoying thing. I'm going to ignore it and draw near to God. And that's, that's fixed for us. I think that's pretty, pretty cool. Satan is very powerful. The devil is very powerful, but he's just the lord of the flies. He's a temporary lord of a nuisance, nuisance of things. So anyways, so they say this about Jesus, and he knew their thoughts. This is pretty cool, either um, by his own reasoning and using wisdom, or it's a word of knowledge, like from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Uh, word of wisdom, word of knowledge, and Jesus has a word. Remember, he emptied himself, so he, if he's going to know something, he's not using his omniscience. He's relying upon the Holy Spirit. And he knew their thoughts and said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. If Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? So kind of interesting. Satan's kingdom was, it was, it's prophesied here, if you will, by Jesus, that it will stand for some period of time until the end of the age, right? Until the tribulation time. Uh, Satan will uh, get the upper hand. He will use the third way or something, some sort of 
communism, socialism, or socialism, capitalism mix of things. We see that transpiring around the world today. Big government with big businesses, with gigantic big budgets, budgets larger than the GDP of any, any nation on itself. Therefore, we need to have a, as, as, a, as a Prince Charles says, we need to have a miracle style, uh, a military style campaign to raise up funding to fight this horrible global climate change thing so that he, I believe he means the Antichrist, will have an unlimited budget uh, to, to do these things. Kind of crazy, the days we live. Well, anyways, Satan's kingdom, which is this world, he's the prince of this age, the prince of the power of the air, he's the king of this, this age, Satan's kingdom is going to stand for a while, right? So there's, a, there's actually kind of a little bit of God's kingdom and Satan's kingdom battling together. But our duty, <laughs> our duty as Christians isn't to go, we are a part of God's kingdom, like the Crusades. Let us get some armor and go and fight and kill them because that's the valiant thing to do. That's what, that's what men do, is it not? No, men are to become fishers of men. And uh, there is a battle, the battle of the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of light, God's kingdom versus Satan's kingdom. Satan's kingdom will stand. We, we see that here. And Jesus says, though, and if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? I think that's really funny. If I'm using in the power of the devil, then how about your exorcist sons? Therefore, they shall be your judge. I, I believe he said that because there were so many uh, exorcists uh, at that time, and they would use um, scripture and and some different things, and, and I've read that they would use herbal remedies and such, and they would do what they could. They, they really intended to try to help people, but they couldn't cast out demons, right? And so it's like, um, so if I'm doing it by the power of Beelzebub, and I'm having success here, then who are your sons casting out demons by with zero success? What's, what's their success rate? How many lepers have they cleansed? Give me a number. I'm waiting for some statistics. You keepers of the law. Well, anyways, let them be your judge. You know, who's really got the power? But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. So, like I mentioned when we were studying the rapture and the day of the Lord being an extended period of time, I believe starting at the resurrection of the church, meaning the rapture when the church is brought up to heaven, and then the day of the Lord begins at that time because Peter says, behold, the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night, right? When the heavens and earth will melt away, okay? So that's an extended period of time. But the kingdom of God has come upon them. If Jesus is casting out demons by the power of the Holy Spirit, then the kingdom of God is there. So Jesus initiates the kingdom of God, and he's intersecting into the kingdom of Satan, which had existed from the time that Adam said, hey, that's a really great idea. I'm going to sin against God. And he relinquished his authority to the devil instead of to God. And so it's been Satan's kingdom for a really long time. That's one of the reasons that bad things happen to good people. But the Spirit of God is, is doing this, and the kingdom of God has come to you. So now we have two kingdoms coexisting on this planet. And one of our jobs is to bring unity. Satan, of course, one of his jobs is to bring division. Now, Satan knows this very well. He probably was there and he listened to this and he said, whoa, a house divided cannot stand. What can I do to destroy this kingdom of God that is upon them, right? He tries to bring division. We see division with his, with his disciples. We see all sorts of division in the church today, we see massive amounts of division. You know, even in the NFL, I've mentioned it before, it's kind of funny, you have the standers and the kneelers, and they've divided something that is, you know, ridiculous. It's a game, right? And I know very well-meaning people who watch the NFL, and they go, that's what I do, I watch football. And I know other really well-meaning Christians who are like, I will not watch it again because they won't respect the flag. And so there's a divide. And so people who used to get together and watch a ball game and fellowship over it, and it was healthy and good, now they don't any longer. And they're like, <laughs> right? And, and there's so many things. And let me tell you, what we've seen thus far since 2020 is the beginning of intentional, well, I can't even say, this is the culmination of 100 years of very intentional 
And let's go back a little bit farther when the Jesuits were created. Several hundred years of very intentional, directed dividing of the body of Christ, okay? You know, case in point, uh, Jan Markell was talking to someone who wrote a book about the, the division that is inside the church now. Um, I didn't really get to listen to the whole show, but he brings up the point of the Southern Baptist Convention. The SBC, Southern Baptists, were such good keepers of God's word for such a long time. Really wonderful. They were like, you know, let's get back to the word of God, and, and they do a really great job. And Dallas Theological Seminary, you know, is a fruit of that, and it's one of the only seminaries that still teaches the doctrine of the rapture. Okay, it's kind of kind of crazy how things have, have gotten. And there's this huge press that it's the church making the kingdom of God here on this earth, and we will make the earth perfect and prosperous, and then Jesus will come back. Huh, that's Catholicism right there. And so we see there's a divide. And so communism, Fabian socialism, um, hmm, the Jesuit order, th these are groups that have intentionally, over the years, especially within the past 200 years, in the past 200 years there's been a phenomenon where mankind has gotten on the long-term train of Satan and his agenda to bring about the end of the church. It's kind of interesting. 200 years. Um, if, if you listen closely to a lot of the conservative, um, genuine Republican uh, commentators and such out there who aren't clearly born-again believers and followers of Jesus Christ, they'll talk the talk of spirituality. They'll quote scriptures. They'll say things, you know, we need to be in the world but not of the world, and we need to follow God and the Spirit, and, you know, and, but they're clearly, they're clearly not proclaiming the Jesus of the Bible. They might have a Jesus, and he is a spiritual guru and whatever, and, and these are New Age spirituality that has been brought into um, Christianity. They have the same phrases the same words, but completely different definitions. So it is a new religion snuck into the church of, uh, of Jesus Christ. And what is, what is Satan doing with that? He learned from this. A house divided cannot stand. So it's one of our duties, no matter how we see the world, how we see it unfolding and things going about, that if there's, <laughs> we're always to be bringing people back to Jesus, okay? And there's going to be divides, and there's going to continue to be divides, and they are intentional divides. And one of the, one of the acts of Marxism, and now they have supercomputers watching everyone's social media to do this, right? They watch your media. It's just, it's not, there's not people behind it. Um, when it comes down to, all right, we've, we found some divides. We've found some places where people are definitely making divides. Then the people sit down, they get around a big table, and they brainstorm how to bring division. It's called the, partially, it's called the Hegelian dialectic process, right? Where you have a thesis and an antithesis, an antithesis. Case in point, God says, this is my son, hear him. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, excuse me. And Satan says, if you are God's son, okay? So we have the thesis, God's word, and the antithesis. So I call it the diabolical dialectic process because Satan, it's always been around, and yes, it does work if we were trying to figure out how to fix the foundation in the church building. You know, some, something like that. We'd all sit, they'd sit down and we'd go, we got this option, we got wood, we got concrete, we got this, we got that. And then you, you dialogue back and forth until you, all of your ideas come together, all the garbage falls to the sides, and you synthesize all the best ideas, and you come up with a change. So this method of synthesizing change, and I'm just not at his synthetic stuff the more and more I learn about <laughs> synthetic things. Anyways, these methods are brought about to bring about change. And so, remember, know this, that we have sin news, CNN, and they have one narrative. And then we have Fox News that has another narrative. And then you have people that are not affiliated with either, who have great credentials and they're really well-meaning and all these things, and they have a different narrative. And then you have people that maybe even don't have narratives. They're so far out. And then people will grab onto theirs and bring it and they share it on social media. And all of a sudden, you have such polar opposites. And then what it does to us, what it does to us is we go, what's wrong with you? Don't you know the truth? can't believe. I can't believe that person just, ah. And then we're frustrated. 
So I just, I just want to remind us that Satan is a murderer from the beginning. And what he would love to see more than anything else in this country is conservatives to use their bare arms, right? Their Second Amendment rights. That was my high school history teacher. He'd always remember, what is it? Your arm itches? We've got a God-given right in this country to protect ourselves. Jesus said, get a sword, right? And, 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 and we take that and we go, we need to rebel. Against the government. Now, the government is, they are not, re, they're rewarding the wicked and persecuting the righteous, okay? They are doing the antithesis of what God would have them to do from the scriptures. So we have means of rebellion in our country, right? We have a vote, we have things. But the rebellion that Satan wants to, to see us do is get out the old, I ain't shot this gun a long time. <laughs> that's gonna feel good. You know, that's not where we're to go. Civil war there is already civil unrest and civil division, and there's division inside the church, but the church is to be a bonding agent that brings people together and brings them to Christ. So no matter how difficult, how hard it is that we want to punch that person in the face, there's something else, a higher calling that we are called to do, and we are called to lay down our lives for people, in essence, as, as Jesus did, you know we're resurrected and we're the church and we live in Christ, but we, we go to the extreme to try to bring about reconciliation. As it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, 22, you know, as if God was in Christ pleading with us, be reconciled to God. For God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So our duty is to stand in unity against this division that is inside the church, outside the church. I mean, communism and so many different groups. They, they look at America and go, it is the last bastion of, I will not say the word democracy. So tired of people saying that. The last bastion of freedom because it is a constitutional republic. People need to grow up and, and, and <laughs> learn their history you know, how many, you hear it from everybody on the news. Everything's like, oh, it's a terrible thing to see happen in a democracy. It's like, you know what? We have a democracy on a local level, but not. Anyways, we have a constitutional republic. That constitution was based upon biblical principles, and that's why it's worked for so long. Anyways, with that being said, we need to stand on the biblical principles and bring unity so much more. Satan is wanting to bring division. Yes, know how to defend yourself. All those things, you have families that you need to defend, stuff like that, that's super good, super important. But we need to walk in the spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. We grew up watching Rambo thinking that's how you deal with problems, right? A, a gun with an unlimited amount of rounds and you just keep, keep shooting. So with that being said, Satan wants division. Jesus is calling them out. He says, if I'm casting out demons by Satan, then uh, who do your sons do it by? Because I have success. They don't. And then he says, or how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? And then he will plunder his house. Isn't that cool? We wonder why today, and I think just because we're not discerning about it a lot of the time, why we don't understand and see, perceive the demonic activity. Could it be that Jesus, when he came, he bound the strong man, right? That there was a lot of binding of Satan so that Jesus came into Satan's house and he bound him so much and he limits how much Satan can do. And that's why 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, when that which restrains is taken out of the way, when the church is raptured, the restraining force that God uses today to keep things at bay will suddenly be gone and Satan will be able to have a heyday on this earth and it will be very bad. And that's why it's called the day of Jacob's trouble or the, um, the tribulation. And then Jesus says this in verse 30, he who is not with me is against me. Okay, so it's, it's so difficult uh, to just continue to walk the line because we we, we know truths and we want to help people know those truths about what's going on behind the scenes and things like that. And, 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 or we think we have truth because we listen to someone who's really far out. Remember that it, it's a communist agenda. It's, it's a CIA agenda to rise up people to 
to bring news that is contrary to the mainstream news so that we are confused and have nowhere to stand. So anyways, remember, so we have one place to go, Jesus. We have one place to go. We have to be with him, okay? He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. So I ran into some folks the other day, and I, you know, they were blocking the road because of the snow, and uh, I'm like, oh, I recognize their faces. I can't remember who they are, and so I'm like talking with them, and they're complaining about the government, and uh, it's so so appealing to the flesh to go, well, let me join in, right? And so, ha, ah, it's difficult because we have these things that we know and we want to share and such, but it's like, gentlemen, the only way that we are going to resolve this is if we draw close to God. That's, that's the only way. It doesn't matter who the next president is, right? Unless he is an evangelical preacher and he says, you know, we got to reel this in, and uh, this is, you know, whatever. But that's not the point either. The point is the people of the land need to turn back to God. And remember, so many of the promises in the Old Testament about healing the land, that's Israel, right? Our inheritance isn't America, okay? Our inheritance is Jesus Christ. So Jesus says a very strong word. He who is not with me is against me. He who does not gather with me scatters. Pastor Chuck Smith, he would say, no vote is a vote no. It's just like, yeah, that's really good. If you have not made up your mind about Jesus Christ, you're not indifferent. You're not an arthritis about the, the information. You're not agnostic. You are a no, okay? It's either, I love it, you know, my way or the highway, right? Jesus, it's, it's Jesus's way or, or nothing else. And so he just says that, and it's really good. And it's one of those things that says, you know, if we will not confess him before man, neither will he confess us before his father and his angels, you know, it's one of those things, it's like, wow, okay, what is the one thing that remains? You know, faith, hope, and love. What, what, what is it that I need to be doing in my life? The one thing that, that is required of me, right? To love mercy and, and uh, to do justly and walk humbly with my God. So we got to always bring it back in. When you see those people that you love to get in those conversations with, you could even start off the conversation. Let them do their thing and go, wow, guys, that's really great information. And I do not disagree with that, but I have to ask your forgiveness because I have not been pointing us to Jesus Christ. We gotta be with him, right? And that's, that's where it's at. You know, he's with it and we need to be with him. Now, in contrast, Jesus says, if you're not with me, you're against me. If you're not gathering with me, you're scattering abroad. And in contrast, he does say in a different place because sometimes you go, wait, I thought you said something different. Luke 9, 49 and 50, oh, John, James and John, the sons of thunder, um, they say, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we forbade him. <laughs> He's with Jesus uh, because he does not follow with us. But Jesus said, do not forbid him, for he who is not against us is on our side. Okay, so it can be different denominations, but they can't just be going God or positive thought, right? It's got to be Jesus. If, if they're preaching the Jesus that is described in the Bible, they're with us. They're not against us. Let them do it their way, and, uh, and that's, that's fine. You know, it's funny when you watch videos about people, there's, there's one way to evangelize, and then people are like, that's the worst way ever, you know, and it's just like, uh, they're evangelizing. <laughs> you know, they may not be getting the whole message out, but they're, they're out evangelizing, and that's good, and we need to do that. It's better to know the gospel thoroughly, never forget the resurrection and the substitutionary atonement. You gotta get those in there. And that God judges sin and he rewards faith. You know, it's pretty much that simple. But anyways, we need to be with him, gathering with him, because if we're not, if we're in those conversations, there's the chance that we might be scattering abroad. That person, they're talking conservative talk, whatever it may be, they're complaining about this, that, or the other thing, and instead of bringing the gospel to bear on their heart, in some way, at least an aspect of it, you, you, if you don't do that, you, you could actually be scattering because they're, they're not, they're like, well, that guy's a Christian and he didn't draw me back towards the Bible, so I think we must be going in the right way. 
So I guess we'll probably end with this. I forgot what time we started. How long? Yeah, probably. So verse 31, therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men. Now it's kind of funny that people get hung up on the second half of this passage, right? Uh, but the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven them. And so then they're like, what's the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? I've heard divorce is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. I've heard, uh, you know, tobacco, par- whatever. You just hear some really crazy things from people. Hey, why, why are you so down? You know, I, I think I've blasphemed the Holy Spirit. It's like, do you have a pulse? You know, are you still alive? Uh, you know, what, what did you do? You know, and, you know, whatever their, their thing is, they, they're very feeling very guilty about it, and Satan condemns them. Sometimes just loss um, is something that we, and we experience the same sort of convicting, the feeling of loss when we, when we fail God, when we do something wrong, and uh, Satan can take that and make us feel really, really poorly. But Jesus starts off the statement with, with therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men. Right, So in Jesus Christ and in not blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, everything is forgiven, right? The old things have passed away. We become brand new. But blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven them. So now we just have to look at the context here. The Pharisees are saying, clearly Jesus is working by some sort of power that is not normal. Right? There's some sort of exterior power that is working in Jesus. He's, he's cleansing lepers. He's healing the blind. He's healing the mute. He's casting out demons. The demoniacs, had no, they stood no chance against Jesus. And so clearly he has a power that is otherworldly or something. And so they say it's the devil. So they just blaspheme the Holy Spirit. They're calling the work of the Holy Spirit the work of the devil. Okay, now today, it's kind of funny. This isn't my own. It's John MacArthur's. Uh, he says in, in Jesus' day, they were accusing Jesus of, you know, the work of the Holy Spirit on the devil. And today, in so many of the hyper-Pentecostally sorts of churches, uh, these uh, the new apostolic reformation churches, they're accusing the work of Satan to be the work of the Holy Spirit, right? They're, they're doing things that are very ungodly and crazy, uh, grave soaking and things like that, and they're going, it's God. Um, no, it's an idol. You need to stop that. Anyways, everything will be forgiven you except for blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. Isn't that amazing? Jesus did not come to proclaim himself. He did not come to protect himself. He came to work in the power of the Spirit to glorify God the Father by becoming the substitutionary sacrifice. He's like... The, People are saying bad things against me. You know what? They're going to nail some nails through my hands uh, in a couple weeks. Um, That's something much more to deal with. So anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. So he's speaking about the eternal situation and, uh, and condition of a soul. So if we continue throughout our life, um, saying that the Holy Spirit is not working, doing these very obviously Holy Spirit-powered things, if we deny the work of the Holy Spirit until the day we die, that is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Okay, There's nothing that living people have done to the extent that they lose their salvation, lose their soul in this life uh, until the end of their life if they continue to reject, resist the clear and obvious work of the Holy Spirit that is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And when they die, then it, it will go into the age to come. So Jesus is um, hoping that the religious leaders, but they see the challenge of Jesus and the miracles of Jesus as a work against them. And we need to make sure that we don't see the things that are happening in this world as works against us, but God is sovereign over all things and he is working in our lives to bring us closer to him. We could look at the situations in our lives like the religious Pharisees here and say, wow, what is happening here? Our fame is, is waning and Jesus's fame is growing. This must be the work of the devil. <laughs> in America today, we oftentimes can think, wow, my stock portfolio is failing. This must be the work of the devil. 
Can you imagine how many more blessings, how many more miracles each of us would have seen in our lives if we did not have cash on hand all the time, right? If we always had to rely upon the Lord to receive that blessing, to have the next meal, to be the, the missionary who prays for every meal and then it miraculously shows up. Just a word for us today as things are getting difficult and things are getting distressed and the potential for food shortages in our world and such, God will not allow the righteous to beg for bread, okay? He's going to find a way. He's going to take care of us. And this is new to us, most likely. I know very few people who have had to live on their own, live on the streets, sneak into McDonald's and and, and grab a few ketchup packets and go make uh, tomato soup out of it. Um, a friend, that was his story. He, he ran away from home early because his house was so bad. And he, I worked with him, and he's a pretty great guy. And it's just like, wow, I've never had to do that. And his faith in God was pretty good, you know. We're coming to a time, we, we could be raptured, but there is also the beautiful blessing that could come from God that he says, I need to refine you more before I bring you to heaven. It just makes me ask and, and wonder, we're trying to remember where I was going to on this. We started out today's session with a, a unnamed person who did not, they were blind and they were mute, um, and it was very likely from a demonic influence in their life, a demonic presence in their life. How much of our inability to hear from God and to speak for God is because of a demonic influence, Right? Fear of man, that's a demonic influence. Complaining, mm, God was pretty heavy about that in the Old Testament. That could be a demonic influence. In all reality, um, everything that is an idol, behind every idol, is a demon, Paul tells us. So anything that we put in place of God, it's not just a thing. Satan, our personal demons, right? They observe us and go, ooh, me, my photography gear over the years. Or hand tools, you know, power tools to do things. I thank God for them. Every time I use them, I'm like, thank you, God, for this tool. I don't want this that makes my life so much easier or the quality of my work to be so much better. I don't want that to become an idol, right? We live at a time where if you wanted to make a widget of some sort and sell it on Etsy and Amazon or whatever, you could become wealthy because of the individuality of the excellence of your work. I mean, we live at a time when if you come up with an idea, there's no limit to how much money you could make. And that's an idol, right? We shouldn't want more than what we can spend. It's, it's a difficult thing to talk about, but behind every idol is a demon. And of course, we find in, oh, where do I have those at? Colossians 3, 5 and Ephesians 5, 5. Covetousness is idolatry. Okay, now I, I just bring this up because of the age that we are living in, and we see that through demonic activity, this person was blind and mute. Could the church be so quiet about Jesus because they are in America, because they are stuck up in a, a, a demonic activity of covetousness, right? We live at a time when the end age church, what does Jesus say to the church of Laodicea, which represents the very end of the age? You are rich, you have need of nothing but yet you are lukewarm. And because you were lukewarm and not cold or hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. And that's a threat from God that is, should be very eye-opening. Uh, we do not want to be power vomited instead of assimilated into the body of Christ because we didn't like it. He rejects them because of a lack of faith. Now, when we think about uh, the age that we live in, and the coming destruction and judgment of what is called Babylon. Revelation chapter 18, Babylon is mentioned, and her merchants stand afar off. Her, her ships are bringing merchandise no more, which is kind of interesting. So uh, I, I haven't read that yet to just kind of, it was just a thought this morning. But we see some similarities, and of course, that's far off, right? We're not, this is not the tribulation, right? We're doing pretty well. Um, but Babylon is judged, and she's judged for her wealth. 
She's judged for her variety of merchandise. And I gotta admit, I like it too. When you're looking for a special gift for someone, uh, the kids found things on Amazon I've never even seen before. You're like, wow, what a cool variety of really super cool things. We found journals for them that they look like they're 300 years old and they're handmade and they're just really, really neat. It's like, don't just use that as scrap paper for your chewing gum. Uh, cool stuff, but one of Babylon's things, it speaks of the merchants and they stand afar off and there will be no more selling of citron and spices and all of these things and it lists off everything you can find on Amazon and eBay combined together and all including the bodies and souls of men, but they are known for their wealth and their exchange and all that they have and all of these things are blinding them and taking their focus off of what is good, what needs to be done, unity in the body of Christ, humility for the body of Christ, and, and an ever-present knowledge of our need for God every single day. Can our resistance to generosity be affected by our want for bigger and better things, our covetousness, which is idolatry? Often, we don't even know why we want something. It's just that product has been projected upon us so many times. Who has boxes of, of a brand new thing in their house? <laughs> it's been there for a while. And it's like, I really probably should unpack that and figure out how it works. Read the instructions, whatever. We all have those things that we purchase because we think it will make our life better. But the only thing that's going to make our life better is, is Jesus. And I just wanted to kind of point out because the end times church and because America has been likened to Babylon by many authors and they find many reasons why they can say, look at our wealth, look at our substance, look at our all that we have. Are we wrapped up in idolatry and finding all of our pleasure and satisfaction, so much of our joy in the things we have and the bucket list that we're able to accomplish because of our deep wallets and the potential and reach of credit and things like that. I understand, I get it, but is our desire for wealth and comfort, is our covetousness, which is idolatry, um, demonically blocking us from being charitable, demonically blocking us from speaking and hearing the word of God? I guarantee you, when we have nothing and someone breaks open the Bible, it means so much more to us, right? And I don't know what to say, but God does, and his Holy Spirit wants to speak to each and every one of us, and he's been dealing with me, too, on these things, that where is my joy, where is my satisfaction, where is my hope? We strive hard, we work hard, we want to get raises at work, I understand all of that, but... God would have us to be free of covetousness. It's a big word. And uh, like I say, we could be raptured right now. There's nothing holding back the church from being raptured. But I really kind of am under the impression that God's going to let us go through it a little bit so that we can say, my hope, my joy, my sustenance, my daily bread. Have we ever had to pray, give us this day our daily bread? It's a prayer that we're taught to pray, and we don't understand what that means. God wants us to bring wants to bring so much more to us, and uh, it might come through our our struggle and our suffering. But what He wants to do for us is never for us to say these hard times have come my way, things aren't going right, the devil's in charge, the devil's in control, right? This is the work of the devil. No. We need to be able to say, my God loves me so much. He's allowing this to come my way so that I can prove my sonship, my part of his family. I can prove that to those who are struggling, those who are in question, those who are in doubt. And it's only through our standing upon the promises of the word, through faith in God, through Jesus Christ. It's only us standing on those things and verbalizing those things that we can let people see the goodness of God in our lives. So Father, I pray, Lord, that you would just be working in each of us, Lord, the things that um, we don't need to have, Lord. We've been uh, bamboozled since the 1920s, 
since the assembly line has been created, everything is uh, thrown at us that we, we need this for our convenience uh, or to keep up with the Joneses, whatever it may be. And we're fallen prey to so much propaganda in the world on, on things we need. But Father, I, I pray, God, and I love living comfortably. I love a warm, warm shower and all those things, God. But I pray, God, we would more and more Lord, be able to find our joy and our salvation, our provision, and all of the good things, Lord, that you give us, that we could find those things in your son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, I just pray, God, you'd be, you'd be helping us to see the things in our life that hold us back from speaking and hearing for you. And uh, we just pray, Lord, you'd bless us, as you always do. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So at this point, no reason why not. We shouldn't have a Wednesday night Bible study. And 